I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles uh, to the book of Mark. We're going to continue on in looking at God's Word for us this morning. We're going to read the book of Mark, chapter 3. I'm actually going to start at verse 6, because I think it gives us uh, a little bit of a helpful understanding into what's going to happen in the next um, the passage today. So we're going to read from verses 6 all the way to verses 19. <clears throat> Mark chapter 3, starting at verse 6, going to verse 19. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, against Jesus, how to destroy him. And Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountainside and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him, and he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and might, he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John, John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, which is sons of thunder. Pretty cool name. Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. This is God's word. We're going to pray, and we'll dive into it. <clears throat> God, I pray for your help today. Um, Lord, I can do nothing apart from you. We can do nothing apart from you. And Lord, even, I pray, Father, that even as, even within me, even within my, my body, I'm struggling with sickness, God, you just make my words clear. And Lord, may they be your words, ultimately, God. I just, I just pray for change today, change in my heart, change in our hearts, God. I pray that it would be um, one that drives us to know you more, God, that we just got to say to you, I want more of you, God. So... Speak to us, God, in this time. Help us to understand what it means, Father, to go through change. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we're continuing through the book of Mark, and Mark is saying this to us. Jesus is the Son of God. That's the main point of the book of Mark. Jesus is the Son of God. It's trying to get this through to us because so many people would say Jesus is just a teacher. He's just a good person. He's just one of those historical figures, this revolutionary, but he's so much more than that. We get that even from the very first book, very first verse in Mark. Us as readers get this revelation to us that, that Jesus is the Son of God. And what's amazing about the Son of God is that Jesus comes not in with pomp and circumstance, not with like, like fireworks going off and trumpets blaring, but Jesus comes humbly as a servant. He comes humbly to save his people, not to just come as a judge and a ruler over them. He comes in love and grace and submission kindness to them. We don't often think about that, but God's kindness to us through Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God who has come as servant and Savior to sinful people, to people who don't deserve it. He had every right to come with, uh, you know, with a hammer, with a sword. He had every right to come and just bash us for our sins, but he doesn't. He comes in grace and humility and love for us. That's what Mark's trying to get across to us. To help us see how great and awesome this Jesus is. How great and awesome this God is who loves us, who cares for us. That's the point. <clears throat> and we're continuing on with our focus. Last week I talked about how um, 
Mark focuses in on three different groups of people, the crowds, the critics, and the followers, none of which understand Jesus. None of them really get him. They're trying to get him. And last week, we looked at the critics. We looked at the religious leaders and how Jesus just didn't mix with, mix with their man-made religion, just didn't fit with the legalism that they had built their lives upon. Man-made religion doesn't respond rightly to Jesus because Jesus came to replace man-made religion with the gospel. The gospel is not that we uh, are accepted because of the good things we do. The gospel is that we are accepted because of what Christ has done, not our works. And so as a result of what Jesus has done for us, we get to serve him and love him and worship him, just like family members, right? People who love us, care for us, and we want to please them. You know, like in a, in a marriage relationship or even with your kids, right? You want to love on your kids. You want to serve your kids because you love them, because they love you. And so we're, today we're, we're taking a shift. We saw how Jesus rejects the, the religious leaders, leaders of those, that day. They, he brings them and he, he calls them out to their empty-hearted religion, and they immediately go out and try to plan to kill him. They want to destroy him. And so Jesus, knowing his time has not yet come, withdraws to the sea, withdraws to the ocean. Now, you notice he does that a lot in Mark. He withdraws to the sea. It's kind of like, and you often wonder sometimes, it's like, okay, Jesus is so famous and so popular He's, so, he's becoming this radical character. Why wouldn't he just kind of press into it? Like go to all the cities, go to all the places, and just like build up his name, right? We, we do that, right? Like just stroke my ego. Come on, like, you know, get, <clears throat> you know, like me, love me. We're going to want more affirmation for people, more acclamation. But Jesus doesn't do that. He, he retreats to the sea. He, he gets back to that. He gets back to where it all started. I think it's primarily just... Basically, Jesus is getting back to that idea, resisting the temptation of, of man, of the kingdom of man, and getting back to his roots, getting back to the understanding why he came, why he came to save people, to save people. And so what we're going to see today is Jesus establishing his kingdom. Jesus is establishing his kingdom as king. He's establishing his rule over all creation, but it looks a lot different than what we might think. Jesus rejects the religion of the religious leaders and withdraws to the sea because the kingdom of God is not built upon empty, lifeless religion. Jesus, we read about in those first couple of verses there today, he goes into the, <clears throat> to, uh, by the sea and people from all around are following him, not just Jewish people, right? Like some of these places were Gentile lands, some of them were like just really like didn't mix with the Jewish culture. And they were coming from all around because they heard what he was doing. They heard that he was healing people. Now, Jesus obviously healed people. He showed grace and love to people, but that wasn't the main reason why he came. But these people thought, well, you know what? I've got a little, you know, I've got a broken foot. Maybe you can heal that. You know, I've, I'm struggling with, you know, some diseases. I got a cold. I got a cough. Maybe Jesus can heal me from that. And so they all flock to him out in this, this sea, this desert region, and they're coming to him because they want him to do something for them. But Jesus, is tr in his grace and love, he heals them. But that's not what the kingdom of God is about. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. It's just about meeting all of your needs. That's not what... The kingdom of God or is, is built upon. It's not built upon fame or selfish ambition. The kingdom of God. Jesus turns his focus, we see in verse 13, from the, the religious leaders and the crowds to his disciples. Ultimately, that first little section there, verses 7 to, 13 to 12, is pointing us to the fact that Jesus sees the crowds and sees what they want, and he gives it to them graciously, but he knows what they really need. He knows what they really need, but they don't want it. You notice how it says they're pressing into him? And Jesus is like, get the boat ready, because you know, they're, press, they're falling on top of me, basically, just even to touch me to be healed. To be healed. 
But the kingdom of God is not built upon the selfish ambition of man. The kingdom of God is built upon who Jesus is. And that changes people. That changes people. I think <clears throat> even in Eastern PEI, even, even for those of us who have been in PEI for a long time, I think there's something deep within us that longs for change. Longs for something, something different. And sometimes we want change, but we don't often think that we're the ones who need it, right? We're like, okay, I want everybody else around me to change, right? My family, my, my husband, my wife, my kids, my friends, it's their fault. They need to change. I'm sticking to my guns. Maybe that's more like our Eastern mentality, right? I don't need to change. Well, the reality is sometimes we, just like these, these crowds here that we read about in this passage today, we don't want to change us. We just want to change our circumstances, right? We just want to change what's going on around me. We're, we're saying, okay, God, you know what? I've, I've been struggling with this sickness now for, for years, and I just want it to be taken from me. Take it from me, and everything's going to be okay. Or, God, if you'll just give me a happy marriage, everything's going to be fine. Or God, you know, if you can just, um, <clears throat> you know, give me a better job, if you can just make my kids listen to me, everything will be okay in my life and I'm not going to come bug you anymore. I want you to change my circumstances, not me. And that's the attitude that so many of us have. Just like these people, they wanted healing. Some of them came to Jesus because they saw, they heard that he was this this great character, they, people were saying he was the Messiah, and for some people, when they hear the word Messiah, they're like, okay, great, this is a political leader who's going to get rid of Ro the Romans, who's going to, you know, come with like a sword and just like and an army, he's going to build an army, and they're going to take over every, all these people who are, are against us, that are just making life hard for us, and they, they see Jesus as this, this um, warrior, but they don't understand to what extent Jesus is a warrior. Jesus is so much deeper than just a political leader. Jesus is actually, he's fighting the battle. He's fighting the fight to bring us back to God. See, they didn't want Jesus for who he was as the Savior of the world. They wanted Jesus to be who they wanted him to be. And we do the same with Jesus. We want Jesus, but just enough so that he keeps us healthy, he makes us nicer, he gives us a better job, and on and on and on, right? I go to church because I make friends. I go to church because, or I, I read my Bible because it's supposed to make me a nicer person, the better person, right? That's our attitude. And we want Jesus to <clears throat> just... We think somehow that it's going to, Jesus comes into our lives to change our circumstances, not us. But the gospel is not so much about Jesus changing or transforming our circumstances as it is about Jesus changing us. Jesus changing us, our hearts, our lives. In our passage today, we're going to look at the blueprints to the kingdom that Jesus is building. And we're going to see that the kingdom of God is not so much a physical place as it is a physical people that God is building. And that making that Jesus brings, that, that mission that Jesus is on to save his people, to establish his kingdom, it brings about change in us. So, quickly, four things. How Jesus establishes his kingdom. How Jesus builds the kingdom of God. First of all, and we're going to be looking primarily at verses 13 to 15 here today. That's the, everything else kind of flows around those, those verses, verses 13 to 15. First of all, Jesus calls. He calls people. He calls his disciples. It says in verse 13, he went up on a mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Now, think about that for a moment. You're Jesus in this illustration, and you are a popular, like, smart, you know, like, you've got a lot of things going for you, and you're supposed to choose guys who you want surrounding you. Who are you going to choose? In our day and age, it's like, okay, give me the best. 
I want the absolute best by my side. They got to be good at administration. They got to be good with people. They got to, you know, have a backbone. They got to be smart. They got to make lots of money. They got, you know, like you think about all these things. And so many of us are, are like, if we're building a business, most often business and marketing will say, surround yourself with the right kinds of people. And Jesus doesn't do that. Look at the list of these disciples. Look at the list of them. You know, we got Simon, Andrew, James, and John, who's a, who are fishermen. Like they're, no offense to you who are fishermen here. <clears throat> I'm shooting myself in the foot right now. Um, <laughs> they are uneducated people back in those days. Uneducated people. They were not, I, you know, I highly respect those of you who are fishermen here today. Um, but back then, they were not very well respected. Back then, it was just, you know, we get enough money to put food on the table and, and you know, they're stinky and smelly and dirty and things like that. And none of you all here today who are fishermen are like that at all. I know that. <clears throat> Full foot out of mouth. You got Simon, Andrew, James, and John who are fishermen. You got Matthew or Levi, who we read about last week, who is a tax collector. Like, he's hated by people. Like, people saw him coming, and they go to the other side of the road just to stay away from him. He was considered a traitor. He worked for Rome. And in those days, the Jews hated Rome. People of Israel hated Rome because they were just the bully who came in, took their money, took their stuff, and made life hard for them. And this guy, um, <clears throat> Matthew, works for them. He's working for Rome, taking their money and taking more than what you know, he should be taken. He's trying to get money. He's a fraud. He's a traitor. And then we have Thomas, who we learn later on is a doubter. He just got lots of issues with believing things. He's like, ah, you know what? I'll believe it when I see it. You got, also, then you got Simon the Canaanite, which actually is translated the zealot. Simon the zealot. Now, the zealots back in those days, those were people who were passionate Jews, passionate for Israel. They would live up in the mountains, and they were basically like your, um, your uh, <clears throat> rebels of that day, right? And they hated Rome. They absolutely hated Romans. They would kill them. They would, they would pillage their lands, all sorts of things. They were re rebelling against Rome. They were the outlaws in those days. Now, if you can imagine what it's like when Matthew, who worked for Rome, and Simon the Zealot, who hated Rome, got together in the same room, right? That's, that's often, like, we, think about, we don't think about the, the cultural influences and the backgrounds that they had. Think about you getting in the same room with your worst enemy, and you're both called by Jesus. That's humbling, isn't it? I'm sure the first meeting didn't do, go well. And then lastly, we have Judas Iscariot, who we learn huh, is not just a thief who steals from the money, the purse that, or the, the money that Jesus is gathering and giving to the poor, he would take it for himself, we learn in Scripture. But Judas also betrays Jesus, ultimately. Why would Jesus surround himself with those people? Well, I think one of the greatest explanations is this. Uh, Henry Blackaby said this, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the call. God doesn't call the qualified, he doesn't, he qualifies the call. You see what I'm saying by that? What I mean by that, or what I think Henry Blackaby's getting at by that is that God starts with us. That's the amazing thing about the gospel, folks, that Christ died for us, he saved us, not when we were perfect, not when we were on our way to being perfect, but when we were still sinners. We were still in the muck, when we were still in the mess, when we're still in the drugs, when we're still in the, like, in the bottle, when we're still in the chaos of our lives. Christ died for us. He saved us while we are still sinners. He's calling you. He's calling me. He's calling us to step into what he's called for us. He's qualifying us. He's the one who does it. It's not us. You look at these disciples and you think, man, I don't know. And we start to see, as, we're going, as we'll start to see throughout the book of Mark, a lot of them just, they didn't, they didn't do too well. A lot of them had their own issues. See, Jesus doesn't call them because they're the best of the best. He calls them because they are the least of the least. 
but he is the best of the best. It's because of him. There's, there's a story about King Henry III of Bavaria in the 11th century. And he grew tired, if you can believe that, he grew tired of court life and the pressures of being a monarch, being a king. And he made an application to the local pastor, the local priest, the prior Richard at a local monastery. He made an application asking to be accepted as a contemplative and, or spend the rest of his life in the monastery as a monk. Can you imagine? A king just putting on you know, robes and spending the rest of his days as a monk. Your majesty, Prior Richard said, the pastor said, do you understand that the pledge here is one of obedience? That will be very hard for you because you've been a king, because you've been able to have everything you ever wanted, because you've lived the high life. <laughs> and King Henry says, I understand that. The rest of my life, I will be obedient to you as Christ leads you. And Prior Richard says, then I'll tell you what you can do. Here's what you are to do. Go back to your throne and serve faithfully in the place where God has put you. And when King Henry died, a statement was written, the king learned to rule by being obedient. When we tire of our roles and responsibilities, it helps us to remember that God has planted us in a certain place and told us to be a good accountant or teacher or mother or father. Christ expects us to be faithful where he puts us. And when he returns, we'll rule together with him. Don't you see? When we follow Jesus, when we, when we have decided to give our lives over to Jesus, there is no calling that is belittled, that is the least of the least. If you're setting up chairs here at church on Sunday, if you're cleaning toilets for the glory of God, and you know this is where God has called you to be, do it for all the passion in your heart to the glory of God. Enjoy him in it. That's, that's the point. But so many times for us, we're like, okay, you know what? There's got to be more for me out there, okay? God wants me to be the actor, the rock star, the, the model. God wants me to be this and this, and, the, and, and we just keep pushing into it. There's got to be more for me in that. We're never satisfied. It's that deep unrest I was talking about last week. The deep unsettlement within us. But Jesus, when he is our true rest, guys, we could be washing dishes for the rest of our lives. Because he is the one who has called us. He is the one who enables us to do what we do. It's not about what you do as your calling in life. But we make it so much about that, right? It's about who you are in your calling and who you are called by. <clears throat> like, I love what David says in the Psalms, right? David, this king who, like, was known as a man after God's own heart, who is known as this, this rock star king, right? Wrote songs. And he, he led his people. He was a great warrior king. He did all these amazing things. He was like the celebrity of that day. And it says in Psalm 84.10, this is what David's saying from his heart. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Do you get that? Like, David's like, I'd rather stand there and open and close the door for people coming into the temple. Like, I'd much rather do that than for me to, to make it all about who I am. The call of Jesus on your life changes you, folks. It does. It changes you from the inside out. You can accept your calling, whatever it may be, whatever it might be seen as or observed as by the rest of the world around you. If you do it for God, it is great. It is not little. So when you're wiping babies' bums, Okay, when you're in, working in the nursery, when you're, you know, serving, you're cleaning up, you know, whatever it might be off the floors of the church after youth group, that is not in vain. That is not. You have a calling in that. You have a calling in that, and do that for the glory of God, just like these disciples were called. Don't neglect the calling of God on your life, wherever it may be. 
Some of you, God might be calling you to much more than that. Maybe God's calling you to step out and maybe you're like, I've never sung a note in my life and I need to, like, maybe I need to start practicing some music or something like that and start learning how to play guitar. Maybe whatever it might be. Maybe God's calling you to lead a community group. The call of Jesus on your life changes you. Firstly, he calls. Secondly, he names. He names He called those whom he desired, and they came to him, and he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles. Now, the word appointed there in the Greek actually means to name. He named them. He appointed them. He appointed 12. He named them the 12. You'll notice the disciples from here on out are called the 12, not the disciples. The 12. He named them. Now, the word appointed means to name, to make, to create. Now, naming was very important back in those days. Naming was extremely important. The name was meant to convey the essence of who you were. If you went through a great change, you changed your name. Right? Oftentimes, you'll, you'll read in the Bible where it's, it, you know, a woman gives birth and they say they named him so-and-so because whatever. You know, like whatever they were going through at the time. The, the name carries with it a great meaning. And it is the same today. Some of you are thinking, well, no, it's not. How, like, how does a name mean something today? Think about this. Do you think, <clears throat> do, you, do you know anything about Albert Einstein, the movie character? Not the scientist, the movie character. Albert Einstein changed his name to Albert Brooks. Maurice Micklewhite changed his name to Michael Caine. Right? Karen Johnson became Whoopi Goldberg. You can believe that. <laughs> Terry Jean Bollette is Hulk Hogan. Now, can you imagine getting into the ring in the WWF with a guy named Terry Jean Bollette? I don't think it works. Hulk Hogan is much more intimidating, right? And my favorite one, Marion Mitchell Morrison. John Wayne. Now, I don't think Westerns would be the same if it was like Marion Morrison stars in this Western. They'd be like... You know, like it just doesn't have that rough and tough appeal to it, right? Names are important. They carry with it meaning. These people couldn't reinvent themselves without renaming themselves, right? See, when you name something, you shape a responsibility. You shape a responsibility. I can think of even just, you know, <clears throat> um, how we named our children. Um, Eleanor means bright light, and to me, it totally fits with where my daughter is at sometimes. You know, dancing around, and and Emmett means strong, and and I pray that's for him. But the reality of that is that responsibility is limited because we are broken people. I can call my son strong. I can call Emmett, which means strong, but I know there's times he's not going to be strong. I know there's times where he's going to feel weak. People don't always become who or what they are named after. Like, look at even at the disciples. Peter is called a rock, but in the Gospels, he's probably the least rock-like, right? Comes down to, do you know Jesus? And three times he's like, no, I don't know him. Never saw the guy before in my life. I'm running. Bye. You know, you got the sons of thunder, James and John, who were at this time probably teenagers. Sons of thunder, okay? Like... And then you got Levi, who his name, Levi means companion, but Jesus changes his name to Matthew, which means gift of Yahweh. Gift of Yahweh. Think about that for a moment. Levi is a gift of Yahweh. He was a tax collector, a fraud, a traitor to his own people. Are you sure that's a gift of God? But the name... Not meant to to is help is to help us understand the person who gave it, the person who is doing the naming. Think about creation in Genesis one. How does God create? He doesn't snap his fingers. He didn't just think things into existence. What does he do? He names things. Right? He says, "Let there be light," and there's light. 
He says he calls the wa- he calls the the the, <clears throat> the waters, the ocean, the sea. He creates by calling the expanse, the sky, the heavens. He names them. Let there be, and there is. This is the amazing thing about God, because when we name, we try so hard to describe. When God names, he defines. God defines. So Jesus names them apostles. He names this ragtag group of guys apostles. He made, he defines, he created them apostles. Not because of them, but because of who he was, right? Tim Keller says this, whatever names you, owns you. Whatever names you, owns you. Think about that for a moment. There's a, there's a very <clears throat> good illustration in the Bible where Jesus is telling the story of the rich man and Lazarus. I'm not going to go into it per se, but, but there's a story where Jesus is talking about the rich man and Lazarus, you know, and the, and the rich man dies and he goes to hell and the, the <clears throat> Lazarus dies and he goes to Abraham's bosom, which is heaven, right? So he, but do you ever notice why Jesus doesn't give the rich man an actual proper name? You ever notice that? He's like, Lazarus, that's his name, but the rich man doesn't actually have his own proper name because Jesus is showing that whatever your identity is wrapped up in, whatever you're, you're wrapped up in became your name. And we do that today, right? There's the alcoholic. There's the drug dealer. There's the single mom. There's the loser. There's the babe. There's the angry person. Because if you lose your identity, you lose your name. But the gospel is that Jesus has come to name you. Jesus has come to give you a new name. It, it, we, were just, we just walked through the book of Revelation, right? In Revelation 2.17, Jesus says, To him who overcomes, I am going to give a white stone with a new name on it. You are named and you are owned by him because he has died for you. That's the gospel. That's the good news for us. That we don't live in the rejection of our mis. Our misgivings, our responsibilities. The name Jesus gives you changes you. Just like it did for these disciples. It changes them. Thirdly, first of all, he he calls, he names. Thirdly, he relates. He says this, so that they might be with him. He, he He appointed them twelve whom he named apostles, so that they might be with him. Jesus is bringing the 12 into close community with him. He's not saying, okay, guys, here's the class times. Show up at this time. Sit down with your pen and paper. Write out all the notes that I'm given. Go home. Do your homework. And come back. You'll write a test. That's not what it is. Jesus is bringing them into close community. So where he goes, they go. When he eats, they eat. You know, when he sleeps, they sleep. And he's bringing them around him to learn from him. Every moment of his life, he's bringing them into close community with them. Not just, you know, just learn or study the words that I say. See what I do. See what I say. See who I am. Understand who I truly am. And the reality of that is that today, so many of us, we don't understand what it means to relate to Jesus. We treat Christianity more like a grocery store than a home. Right? We treat Christianity like, you know, we, we go to the grocery store and we get what we want. We have someone else do all the work for us. We leave when we're done. And we treat Jesus that way, right? You know, I, I'm going to go to you, Jesus. I'm going to go to, you know, my Christian faith, get what I want. You know, someone else better do the work for me. They better, you know, preach a good sermon. They better have some good music at church. And then when I'm, when I'm done, I'm done. I'm checking out. I'm gone. But what if we treated Christianity as a place to go to be, a place to dwell, a place to live, a place to relate, a place to relax, to refresh, to work, to build, to love, to cherish, to defend, and to grow? Because that's that's our our heart and hope for our homes, right? It's a a refuge. It's a stronghold. It's a place we want to build, right? We want to grow. But we don't treat Christianity that way. J.I. Packer says this, it's not simply enough for us to know about God, but we must turn that knowledge about God into knowledge of God. To knowledge of God. 
See, there's a difference between knowing God as judge and knowing God as father, right? This is the same way there is a difference between my kids knowing me as pastor and as father, right? I want my children to know me as father. I don't want them to know me as pastor of Centerpoint Church, right? I want them to, to, I want them to want to go camping with me, to wrestle with me, to read books. I want them to relate to me. I don't want them to just be like, okay, sit down. We're going to read a Bible story. I'm going to preach to you. I'm going to just pray for you, and then that's it. Get out of my sight. Right? I, I want to know my children. I want them to know me. I want them to see all my weaknesses. I want them to, I want to rejoice with them when they get a good mark on a test. I want to celebrate with them on their birthdays. Same way with God, right? It's the same way with God. He wants to come into our lives and celebrate the things in your life. He wants to mourn with those of you who are mourning, who are struggling. He wants to struggle with you. And so many times we're just like, okay, I need to just separate myself from God in that moment. Okay, God would not be happy where I'm at right now, so I just need to separate him from that. No, bring him in. Bring him into the hurt. Bring him into the pain. See, it's not what you know, but who you know that saves you. It's not the measure of your faith, but it's the object of your faith. It's the object of your faith that saves you. The relationship you have with Jesus changes you, folks. It changes you. Lastly, number four, first of all, he calls us, he names us, he relates to us, he sends us. He sends us. He sends his, his apostles out. He might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Jesus enables his disciples to do the very things that he has done. The very things that he has done. We read back in chapter 1, verses 21 to 28, where Jesus goes into the synagogue, he preaches and teaches, and casts out a demon. Jesus is like, that's what you're going to do. I'm giving you that authority. I'm giving you that power. We are sent on mission by the God who is on mission. This is an incredible picture. Think about that for a moment. We are sent on mission by a God who is not just sitting on his throne, right? He's not just like, <clears throat> I'm going to just sit on my throne and you guys do all the work. You're my subjects, do all the work. What kind of leader is that? But we have a God who says, follow me into the mission. Follow me into the battle. I'm going there because there's people I love in there. I'm going after them. Follow me into it. Don't, don't just sit back. Let, follow me on my mission. Now, G.K. Chesterton says this. I love this. A soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. A soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. So we go loving God, loving Jesus. We go on mission telling people about Jesus. We go battling against the kingdom of darkness, against the, the spiritual forces of darkness in this world, not because it's like, oh, I hate that. I'm going to take that person down. They're evil. They're wrong. I just can't wait to bash them with a the Bible. You know? We go because of out of great love and, and joy in what Jesus has done for us. That's what spurs on our mission. Our mission flows out of our relationship with God. Now, the word apostle means sent one. Sent one. Sent into all the world. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, the Great Commission, Jesus says this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see what Jesus is doing there? He's wrapping up, like how I said before, our, what names you owns you. Jesus is wrapping up our identity in the mission. In the mission. He's wrapping up our identity in the mission. We are named, sent ones, as followers of Jesus, as those who go out. These disciples are called sent ones, and he's wrapping up in them himself, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of your age. I am there. All authority has been given to me, and you get to go with me. I give you that identity. 
See, in this world where we are so, so pressed to find ourselves, the one thing we can learn from what Jesus is, is sharing with us is that you can never find yourself directly. You can never find who you are directly. You must lose yourself to find yourself. Right? Jesus says, if, if anyone wants to gain his life, he has to lose it. He has to lose it. It's only when you help others find themselves that you truly find who you are. You get that? It's only when you are helping others find who they are in Jesus, finding themselves as loved and cherished and, and, being <coughs> and, and uh, <coughs> redeemed by what Jesus has done, it's only in that that you start to find out who you are. Martin Luther says this, by God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbors do. Right? God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbors do, right? They need us to be serving them, loving them, preaching to them, telling them about Jesus. Folks, they need it. Like, there are people who are going to a Christless eternity. Folks, I know a, a pastors get up and they preach and they push on this one hard, but in all reality, do we truly love Jesus enough to say that I care about those people who don't know him? Does it flow out of our relationship with God? Do we under, does it break our hearts that our community is breaking under the effects of sin? Montague is not exempt, okay? PEI is not exempt. We are breaking under the weight of sin. We need a savior. Does it not break our hearts that people are don't know Jesus, does it not break our hearts? See, folks, the kingdom of God is not for the taking, but it is for the giving. We get the kingdom of God only when we give. Being sent by Jesus changes you. So what does this mean? Well, the gospel is not so much about Jesus changing our circumstances as it is about Jesus changing us. Notice that it's Jesus who does it. Jesus is the one who <coughs> calls. He's the one who names. He's the one who relates. He's the one who sends. It's all wrapped up in Jesus. He is the cornerstone, the foundation that the kingdom of God is built upon. Now, the kingdom of man thinks that if only the circumstances were different, they'd be fine. It'd be so much better. You know, if only I could just get out of this mess I'm in right now, I'll be fine if I can just only get rid of this pain that I'm walking through. If I can only just, you know, if you'll just do this, I'm going to be fine. If you just get me a job, just give me finances, if you give me whatever, I'll be fine. So many of us pray this to Jesus. Just get me out of the chaos that I'm in right now. But folks... Jesus came, and I really, truly believe this is what he's saying in verses 8 to 10. Jesus came to show them the chaos of their lives. These people who only in their selfishness, in their self-centeredness, wanted to be healed for their own good. They wanted their circumstances changed. And it becomes chaos, right? Like the people are falling over, almost like they're almost falling and trampling all over Jesus just so they can touch him, just so they can just make their lives different. Do you understand the significance of that? Jesus came into the chaos. He entered into the chaos. But when he enters into the chaos, later on a mountain called Calvary, when he dies on the cross for our sins, there is no boat for him to back onto. There is no disciples to pull him out of the crowd. And in that moment, he is crushed and pressed for us. Jesus came into the chaos to call us out of the chaos, to name us, to know us, to send us, and ultimately, folks, to change us, to transform us. Maybe some of you have heard of the infamous serial killer, the son of Sam, and the horrible things that he has done. David Berkowitz was named the Son of Sam because in the summer of 1976, going through to 1977, he murdered six people and injured seven others with a gun. 
And he was captured, and he's now serving life, a life sentence in jail. And you know what's even more shocking than what David Berkowitz did in taking those people's lives? What's even more uh, outstanding, what I find even more uh, troubling, or maybe even more um, just radical in my mind than him killing all those people is the fact that in jail he came to Jesus. In jail, someone handed him a Bible, and he read Psalm 34, 6, which is the gospel in a nutshell. It says this, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. He was, his life was changed forever. And it, and it actually says that his name changed from the son of sand to son of hope. To son of hope. And folks, he's spending the rest of his life behind bars. He's in a jail cell. And, and actually, he, after a certain amount of years, I guess the way it works is he has to automatically go for parole. And just recently, I think it was back in like 2002, it says, I was reading this past week, that he canceled his parole hearing. Do you know why? Do you know why? He stated this, in all honesty, I believe I deserve to be in prison for the rest of my life. But I have, with God's help, long ago come to terms with my situation and have accepted my punishment. How could he accept such a position? How could he accept such a place, rubbing shoulders with some of the most disgusting, some of the most like <clears throat> cruel, evil people in all, uh, all the world? How could such a person Accept that, unless he was changed. Because now what David Berkowitz does as he serves out the rest of his life sentence in jail is pastors and counsels inmates who have killed and murdered and raped and broken lives, bringing them to Jesus. See, this is what God does for us, folks. He calls us sometimes to the most unlikeliest places. God calls us sometimes even into a jail, right? To serve people, to love people. So that even scripture says there is no corner of the earth where their voice is not heard. And though his circumstances did not change, he was. Because folks, Jesus changes us. That's the focus. Jesus changes us. Now look at these disciples. They were ordinary men who history will remember as extraordinary men. They ran from the cross when Jesus was arrested and beaten and broken and sentenced to die on Calvary. They ran from the cross and they spent their entire lives trying to get back to it. They spent their entire lives trying to get back to that place of sacrifice. The place of love. The disciples, every last one of them, save John <coughs> and Judas, who took his own life, every last one of them were martyred, were killed for their faith in Jesus. Some of them were, some of them were <coughs> drawn and quartered. Some of them were hung. Some of them had spears shut. Some of them were, were burnt at the stake. Some of them were skinned alive. It's horrible, the things that have happened to them. But they say... <laughs> Not for me. Not my, my, my circumstances don't matter. But I serve the one who has changed me from the inside out. And if I have to give my life for Jesus, and so be it, I would do so with great joy. See, God called them and they answered that call. So will you answer that call today? Will you answer the call that Jesus, that Jesus is placing on your life? See, the disciples followed Jesus and ended up changing the world. The crowds, all they wanted was something from Jesus to change their lives only. But the disciples, they followed Jesus and they changed the world. They didn't just change themselves, they changed the world. So what's center point? Is our focus on crowds or is it on followers? Is it on people who are just going to fill these seats, or is it on people who actually understand the call of Jesus? 
the name that he has given them, the relationship that they can have with him, and the fact that he sends them out from here to bring glory and honor and praise to him. Folks, Jesus wasn't concerned about the size of crowds, and we shouldn't be either. Where is God calling you to today? Do you understand what he has done to change you? He's given his life. He's given himself for you. Know that today. You are bought with a price, not that you can live in that name that the world calls you by, that sinful name that you call yourself by when you look in the mirror in the morning, but you can live in that, in that new name, that new identity that Jesus has given you. You are not broken. You are not ugly. You are not fat. You are not the alcoholic. You are not the drug dealer. You are not the, you know, whatever it might be. You are a child of the king. And he's building this kingdom through you today. So take this new kingdom and let's, let's spread it, folks. Let's, let's, let's grow in it in our own lives. Let's, let's see how God is qualifying those of us who are called so that we might go out and change the world. But it starts with changing us. Let's pray and we'll close together. Jesus, I thank you. You are so good. We need you, Lord. Oh, God, how we need you. Lord, I pray that as we encounter the circumstances, the storms of our life, God, that we would look to you, the author and perfecter of our faith. God, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So God, because what Jesus has done, we can endure it. God, you, you give us a cross to bear, not that we can escape it, but that we can endure it because you have endured it. So Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now. I don't, I don't know the circumstances they're going through. I don't know what the struggles are in the back of their mind, even as they're sitting here today. There are likely some really deep, heavy stuff they're dealing with. The Lord called them. May they know the God who has given himself to bring relationship and calling and a name and a purpose to their lives. I pray this in Jesus' name here today. Amen.